This video is brought to you by NordVPN. On Sunday, some 64 million Turkish citizens went to the polls to elect their president and parliament. Before the election, polling gave Kemal Kilic Duroğlu and the six-party opposition coalition a slight lead over incumbent president Recep Erdogan and his AKP party, who've been in power for the best part of two decades. But on Monday morning, with over 99% of votes counted, it looks like Erdogan has actually outperformed the polls and is in fact about four points ahead of Kilic Duroğlu. As neither candidate has reached the 50% threshold, thanks to a strong showing from the third candidate, Ogan, this means that there'll be a runoff election on May the 28th between Erdogan and Kilic Duroğlu. So in this video, we're going to have a look at the results, why Kilic Duroğlu apparently underperformed the polls, and how the upcoming runoff election might pan out. So let's start with the results. Turkish citizens had to cast two votes, one for their parliament and one for their president. Let's start with the parliamentary results. Turkey's parliament is split into 87 multi-member constituencies. Within each constituency, MPs are elected via a proportional representation system using the de Hunt method. There's also a 7% minimum vote threshold for parties, but this doesn't apply for independent candidates. In practice, this means Turkey's system is broadly proportional, but it slightly advantages larger parties. Anyway, at Sunday's election, Erdogan's AKP party emerged as the largest party, winning 35.5% of the vote and 266 seats. While this might sound like a good result, and in some senses it is given how the polls were looking before the election, this is by far and away the AKP's worst result in recent history. For context, they won 49.5% of the vote in 2018 and 41% of the vote in 2015. Kılıç Duroğlu's CHP party came second, winning about 25% of the vote and 169 seats. But a strong showing by the AKP's main competitor party, the MHP, who won 10% of the vote and 50 seats, means that the pro-Erdogan coalition has kept its majority in parliament. This is a remarkably good result for the MHP, a staunchly conservative Turkish nationalist party who were polling on about 7% in the run-up to the election. Generally, the CHP performed well in urban areas, winning majorities in Ankara, Izmir and along the western coast, while Erdogan and the AKP performed well in rural areas, which tend to be more conservative and retain the upper hand in Istanbul. As expected, the pro-Kurdish Yesil Sol, the successor to the MHP party, performed well in the southeast, where most of Turkey's Kurdish minority lives. In the presidential election, Erdogan came in first place with 49.2% of the vote, about four points ahead of Kilic Duroğlu, who won about 45% of the vote. Erdogan was denied a majority by a strong showing from third candidate Sinan Ogan, who won 5.3% of the vote. Again, Erdogan performed well in rural areas in central Turkey, while Kilic Duroğlu performed better in urban and Kurdish areas. Kilic Duroğlu also performed pretty well in areas that have been affected by the earthquake, especially in areas to the west of Gaziantep, although Erdogan put out a strong showing in Gaziantep itself, a traditional Erdogan stronghold. As no candidate got 50%, this means there'll be a two-candidate runoff election between Erdogan and Kilic Duroğlu on May the 28th. All this raises the question though, why did Kilic Duroğlu underperform the polls? Before the election, most polls had Kilic Duroğlu on track to win in the first round. Not only did this not happen, but he was also beaten by Erdogan. This is probably something to do with polling methodology. It's easier to contact young people living in urban areas who are more likely to answer the phone or respond to an online survey. And it's hard to measure sentiment in Turkey's rural areas, which ended voting overwhelmingly for Erdogan. Erdogan might have also been helped by the turnout, which was extraordinarily high. Turkey always has a very high turnout rate. It was 86% in 2018 and 85% in 2015. But provisional data suggests it was about 90% this year. While you might expect this to help Kilic Duroğlu, it looks like it might have been pro-Erdogan voters who came out to defend the incumbent against the possibility of change. At this point, we should say that both Kilic Duroğlu and Ogan have voiced concerns about the vote count. 
Kilic Dorolu has accused Erdogan and the state-run Anadolu news agency of delaying results in places where Kilic Dorolu was doing well to exaggerate Erdogan's lead, while Ogan claimed that he had heard of overseas votes being manipulated. However, the fact that the counts from the state-run Anadolu news agency and the opposition-aligned Anka news agency basically matched up suggests that the votes were indeed counted fairly, especially because the two agencies actually count the votes differently. Essentially, Anadolu counts the votes at the provincial level, while Anka counts them at individual polling stations, to make sure there's no change in the numbers as they're being delivered. Generally, this was a pretty great result for Turkish democracy. While the election wasn't necessarily fair, the voting process was almost entirely peaceful and free. Turnout was high, and both sides broadly agree on the final count. So, who's going to win the runoff on May the 28th? Well, at the moment, Erdogan is definitely the favourite. Not only did he win the most votes the first time around, but Ogan, the third candidate, is ideologically closer to Erdogan than Kilic Durolu. Ogan is a die-hard Turkish nationalist, who used to be the member of the MHP, Erdogan's main coalition partner in government, and he performed best in conservative areas, which are generally Erdogan-leaning. While Ogan has said he'll support Kilic Durolu if Kilic Durolu agrees to exclude Kurdish parties from his alliance, Kilic Durolu is unlikely to agree to this, and even if he did, he'd need to win something like 80% of Ogan's votes to beat Erdogan, which is unlikely. Perhaps the only thing that could ruin Erdogan is the economy. As we've explained in previous videos, the lira is down over 60% compared to before the pandemic, and it's only being kept afloat by intervention from Turkey's central bank. So far, Erdogan has been able to maintain his popularity by dishing out generous handouts to key constituencies. But if the currency crisis gets worse, which is at least possible, and Erdogan proves unable to protect his key constituencies, then he might finally pay a political price for the economic crisis he's created. All in all, it's not a good result for Turkey's opposition. Kılıç Dörolu looks unlikely to win on the 28th, and even if he does, he'll struggle to get anything done given the composition of Parliament. A few weeks ago, we were invited to Downing Street, where we were briefed on the government's anti-fraud plan. As part of this, we found out that more younger people have fallen victim to online scams than over 35s. And, as our analytics frequently tell us, our audience skews younger, which means that you're likely in this age bracket. So, if you want to protect yourself online, you should try NordVPN. NordVPN has a bunch of tools that keep you safe. First, they have a feature called Threat Protection, which protects you from malware, trackers, malicious ads, and phishing scams. But that's not all. NordVPN also has dark web monitoring services, which, even if you somehow do fall victim to online fraud or scams, notifies you if your details end up online, so you can promptly change your passwords and keep yourself protected. And what's more, if technology isn't really your thing, don't worry, NordVPN offers 24-7 customer support and even a 30-day money-back guarantee for all users. So check out our link in the description to get your discount on their two-year plan, plus four extra months on top of that. Thanks for your support.